In my book, The Cosmologies of Capitalism, <coughs> which should be published in 2023, I look at an area which only became a, a real interest in my 40s. When I was young, in other words, at Oxford or at school, I don't think I really th examined the fact that my own belief system in terms of causation, history, time, and so on, was very local and very uh, historically placed. In other words, it wasn't absolutely true. It was fine for me and it provided a framework for my thought, but it wasn't what everyone had thought all the time or thought at that time in other parts of the world. I only gradually became aware of the relativity of my own thought systems uh, when I, I think when I started to study anthropology at the London School of Economics in the uh, in 1966, 67, and I began to read more seriously about how different tribal and peasant societies uh, in the world had entirely different ideas of time, space, causation, and so on. They were all, of course, fairly small scale cases, and I could disregard them if I wanted. But when I read a, an article by Ernest Gellner, called Concepts and Society in 1967. He was a sociologist at the, at the London School of Economics. I was blown away because he applied this idea of relativity to his own world, to Western philosophy and theory, as he'd done in an analysis of Oxford linguistic philosophy, um, words and things. And so he shook me up and I became more interested in that, which I think was increased by the fact that I moved from one intellectual set of assumptions, that is o Oxford, to the London School of Economics, which had a different set of assumptions, and then on to Cambridge. So I began to see how my firmly held beliefs were really ways of thinking or a folklore or mythology appropriate to where I was at that time. I didn't go into this much more except when I gave some lectures on Marx, um, uh, Tony's Maine and others in um, the second year that I was uh, had become an anthropologist on great thinkers and communities and I began to dissect their thought systems. But it was really only in 1982, when I'd more or less finished another draft of a long book on English marriage, which I'd been attempting to do for some years. And in the summer of 1982, in July, I finished that, that draft. And I thought, well, what shall I do next? And the obvious thing I had to do next was to write a set of lectures on evolution and society. My new head of department, Ernest Gellner, was arriving a year later, uh, which would uh, influence me. And I'd listened to his lectures over the years, which had again stimulated me into questioning my uh, philosophical assumptions. And uh, I was asked by Jack Curry to give a set of lectures uh, eight lectures on this. And the summer is the time when, <clears throat> if you're doing a new set of lectures, you start. So on the 9th of July, 1982, I started um, not knowing where it would lead. And in this talk, I want to explain what I found uh, to begin with, which is the framework, the background for the book on cosmologies of capitalism. What I'll do is I'll quote from contemporary documents, trying to remember how you thought about things 40 years ago is not easy, but fortunately I kept two records of my thoughts in July, August, September, 1982, 
One was in a diary. So um, this is our home diary. And from time to time, I would say, um, uh, for example, um, on the 29th of November, November, that was towards the end, uh, the um, what I had discovered by that time. So there are just a few fragmentary uh, references. Alan is writing his uh, lectures or that the lectures are going well or whatever it is. The real source though is something which uh, I've kept uh, since about 1978. It's a big, very big book um, which I pretentiously call my Great Thoughts book. And uh, uh, in fact, I, I didn't start in 1978, I started in 1982, precisely when I was about to write these lectures. The first um, entry is on the 8th of July, and there I tidy up and say I'll finish my book on marriage in England for the time being. And then the next day, I say, having finished my draft of a work on marriage in England, my thoughts already turning to the next set of lectures on evolution and society. And from then on, through this uh, book, um, I periodically, every few days, a week or so, write something about how that is proceeding. So what I'll do is I will quote from my account and from time to time when I draw a diagram, which became important as a way of thinking about these problems, and some of them are in the book, I will uh, show you the diagram and what I was thinking. So this is the first entry on the 9th of the 7th. Having finished my draft of a work on marriage in England and off to tomorrow to witness uh, in a wedding, um, and I'm turning to the next set of lectures on evolution and society. I'm tempted to structure these around Kuhn's theory of structures, structure of scientific revolutions. But instead of stopping at the interesting point, as Kuhn does, when he shows that paradigms change at a high level and affect a whole set of lot of disciplines, and that this happens not because of superior logic, truth, accuracy of new observations, but because of many social and other factors, I would attempt to go on to look at why certain paradigms were attractive and why they should be superseded. It would partly be a testing extension of Kuhn, but also an organising framework for a host of other fairly high-level and abstract observations concerning the social sciences in general, including history and social anthropology. This attempt to see which types of explanation, which cosmologies and systems of thought are meaningful and why at certain stages would also follow a certain strand in anthropology. It has long been shown that people only believe, accept as explanations, certain things which fit their experience. They tend to create or recreate these systems. Thus, for example, myths and beliefs are manipulated in order to justify things that the past is molded manipulated to justify or explain the present. Indeed, it is not as simple as that. The past and theories of how we got here and where we will go appear to grow naturally out of the present situation. It is not as crude as many neo-Marxists claim, but certainly ideologies are partly determined by the economic, social, class and other relations. How does this relate to the theme of the lectures? It will probably be argued <clears throat> that there have been in history and the social sciences several major paradigms dominant for longish periods. These are roughly as follows. And I then drew in the uh, book the following diagram.
This showed that um, pre-1750, there was a cyclical view of history. 1750 to 1850, a very modified but growing evolutionism. 1850 to 1914, full-blown evolutionism. Uh, 1914 to 1975, anti-evolutionism, namely diffusionism, functionism, and so on. And then 1975, a return. And in each case, I drew little diagrams, which are in the book. How can we explain these? For example, the Darwinian revolution of the mid-19th century, or functionalism in the early 20th century, it is partly a ma matter of new information. The Beagle, Haddon on the Torres Straits, Levi Strauss in Brazil, etc. But it is clearly as much, if not more, a climate of opinion, which makes the old explanations old fashioned and encourages people to look for the new. What shows this to be the case is that there are, as in Kuhn's paradigm shifts, associated shifts in a number of different disciplines at about the same time. But if this is indeed the case, how should we start explaining the revolutions? Again, it depends on one's perspective. But the argument I shall probably pursue is that the major causes lay in power relations between the nationalities and countries of the world. Very roughly, there are the follow well, there seem to be the following, and I showed another diagram. This showed that up to 1750, between Europe and the rest of the world, there was rough equality. 1750 to 1850, there was grown growing technological and political superiority and a sense of steady progress. 1850 to 1914, a massive technological superiority in the West and rapid uh, evolution. 1914 to 1975, growing equality and a retreat from empire, a steady state. And then 19. 70s onwards, American dominance, and again, some sort of evolutionism. Thus, one might fit anthropology, sociology, history as systems of explanation uh, in them as twin relations of the theorists as follows. The relations between A and B, that is, between Europe and the rest, and the relationship between the present and the past. I wrote this, and then 11 days later, uh, on the 20th, I wrote again in my thoughts book, have finished a first very rapid sketch of my evolution argument. So it's as often one has to do it very, very quickly to sketch it in get the rough framework and then fill it out. Among the reasons which may be behind the new evolutionism of the 18, 1970s, and which I have not mentioned, are A, the dominance of America, C, American power and the new mandarins by Chomsky and so on, and B, almost all those involved in more aggressive forms of evolutionism are American whether earlier historians like Notstein, Lawrence Stone, who is working in America, though British, and others, as Peacock, Marvin Harris, Lynn White, and others. B, the gap in technology of destruction, what gunpowder and cannon were to arrows in the 16th century, nuclear weapons are to conventional weapons, horrifyingly more powerful. One is in a new era. C. Travel, once again into a new dimension. 
this time into space rather than the closed world of 1900 to 1970, the Moon, Mars and so on. This excitement expansion is very clear in the pages of the National Geographic magazine, which devotes much time and coverage to space travel from the 1960s. The same day, uh, I tried to make a diagram of this, uh, of the factors uh, in the following form. And that showed a circle in the middle, which was the observer, um, that we're living within a, a bubble of the spirit of the age or the paradigm, and then looking upwards um, to past time and then future time, comparing themselves with the past and the present, and looking sideways in space um, and comparing themselves with other civilizations. So I continue to write, and on the 23rd of July, three days later, I wrote under the heading, The Different Components of Evolutionism. And I wrote, literally, evolutionary means the unfolding, the opening out, the bending back of a system. It thus means change, but also continuity. Thus one has an organic metaphor, no sudden ruptures or revolutions, progressive. Onto this, however, there tend to be grafted two features which make an otherwise rather useful metaphor less palatable to us. The first is the idea of progress, advance and so on, usually along the continuum of various scales of rationality, as in Lecky and Weber, morality, as in the 19th century evolutionists, civility and civilization, as in Norbert Elias, economics, as in Rosto or Polanyi, personality, from child to adult, equality, political integration, and freedom. Usually this is implicit in the language of space, colour and time. For example, modernisation against the old world, the advance as against decline, upwards and arising through space, darkness into light and so on. The second is the idea of unilinear evolution. That is to say that all societies will pass through roughly the same stages. Once we have an idea of what these stages are, we can then determine freely the society's relation to each other. Secondly, the society's relation to its past and future and where it is going. Thirdly, there is the idea of the leading place of one part of the globe. The society which promulgates evolutionism usually does so partly to place itself at uh, the head of this line. We are here, they are there. It is then its duty to help the others to catch up. The same day I wrote a, uh, and did a, a diagram to show the types of change in the system uh, as follows. This shows firstly cyclical time and linear history, secondly progressive time and the opposite is de degeneration, thirdly wave-like equilibrium, fourthly different levels, um, morality, technology and so on, or all at one level, and five, fifthly continuous or revolutionary types of change. And the same day, I was obviously really excited by this time, I did another diagram on the curious alternation of concepts 
of change and evolution as follows. Um, this showed in diagrammatic form the first unwinding of the circular time and becoming lineal, then evolutionism, then static geolo geological and structural time, and then uh, rapid, uh, more rapid growth with technology, and late, more recently evolutionism. The next day I wrote on uh, concepts of time, change and space, and I quoted Evans Pritchard, a central idea I got from him on the Noah, page 108. It will have been noted that the Noah time dimension is shallow. How shallow is Noah time may be judged from the fact that the tree under which mankind came into being was still standing in western Noah land a few years ago. Beyond the annual cycle, time reckoning is a conceptualization of the social structure, and I'd underline that. It is less a means of coordinating events than of coordinating relationships. That was the central insight into my lectures. This provides one of the keys, I wrote. The first reminds one of the explosion of time depth in the 19th century. In a strange way, as the biblical chronology was dropped or undermined by geology, it was exactly the period of European expansion. It is as if an expansion in one dimension required a deepening in another. It is as if a newer lineage had suddenly expanded much more widely, hence time had deepened. One could very crudely make a diagram of this as follows, as I did again. The job of sociology, I continued, and anthropology was to try to map out some of the new hatched in spaces. Hence, it's not surprising that there should be an obsession with origins, with evolution. As time beginnings suddenly shot back millions of years, and as space suddenly shot outwards at lightning speed, <coughs> it was a huge mental task not merely to document and assimilate, but also to explain and classify. The works of Spencer, uh, Marx, Morgan, Tyler, and the rest were really doing these things, to come to terms with this. And so, as time and space deepens, as one begins to feel that things are moving outwards and backwards incredibly fast, one gets a heightened sense of change. Four days later, on the 27th, I wrote under a heading, Evolutionary Laws. It is clear from Spencer's account of his theory of evolution in his autobiography that the central feature was religious, a faith, a replacement for the loss of Christianity in the mid-19th century. In other words, Anthropology and sociology, as Keith Thomas joked, were substitutes for religion, a secular view of progress. The central feature is the te teleological inevitable nature of evolution. Human societies, like organisms and animals, necessarily move in a certain direction to diversity or the division of labour. Thus, for Herbert Spencer, Tyler and the rest, the law of evolution provided the explanation how, of how things had come to be as they are and what they would be in the future. Christianity was increasingly incapable of dealing with the expansion of time and space from the mid-18th century onwards. Sociology and anthropology and evolutionism 
were born out of the mingled enlightenment and despair, that's a quote, which the vacuum created only itself to be undermined. My next longish entry is the next day, the 28th of July, under the reaction against evolutionism and Robert Chambers. It looks as if the rapid development of evolutionary thought in political philosophy, law, economics, etc., in the work of later 18th century philosophers of the French and Scottish Enlightenment was suddenly reversed and largely crushed by the reaction after the French Revolution. The period 1750 to 1790 can thus be seen as a period of a, an optimistic, progressive evolution of systems. The final burst was in the American Rebellion, the French Revolution and the works of Paine, Thomas Paine and William Godwin, the perfectibility of man, and in the work of the Romantics, the first phase, Coleridge, Wordsworth and so on. Then came a savage re reaction, politically, religiously, intellectually, in the works of Malthus, Paley and so on which roughly lasted from 1790 to 1840. To speak of progress was heresy. Anthropology and sociology as substitutes or alternatives to theology were stopped dead in their tracks. Interestingly, the development that then occurred, occurred right outside the formal academic channels on the whole. In observations and analyses, it was the gifted amateur who made the running and finally brought the whole edifice crashing, bringing back evolution and enlightenment. Thus, for example, Schoolcraft and Catlin observing American Indian societies, amateur observers of America, J.C. Pritchard, sanitary inspector, Hugh Miller, self-made geologist, Charles Darwin, amateur zoologist. An archetype of the gifted amateur, and in many ways the linchpin of the whole movement was Robert Chambers. His importance was central, centred around two facts, and if you're interested in this, I wrote with my mother a biography of Robert Chambers of Edinburgh, which documents all this in detail. A, his Vestiges of Natural Creation, his book, summed up current knowledge free from orthodox pressure and was enormously popular. It left the way open for Darwin. B, his other books, and especially the printing press that he started with William W. and R. Chambers and encyclopedias, opened up knowledge, new information and knowledge could no longer be squashed by a conspiracy of theologians and dons. He unlocked the gates of, to ordinary mechanics, etc. It was in many ways the second Gutenberg revolution, equivalent to television in its impact. It opened up the floodgates of new knowledge to the rising middle classes. As a Scotsman, a disciple of Walter Scott and visitor of all the oldest inhabitants in Edinburgh, he was directly in touch with the Scottish Enlightenment. He kept the flame awake and built on it. Thus, while Herbert Spencer and others were completely ignorant of the tradition, he kept it going. As a bookseller and avid reader, he absorbed the Enlightenment. Thus, Chambers is a central figure in the development of modern civilization, a turning point and a fascinating man. Furthermore, the circumstances of the publication of Vestiges are such that it is a, an excellent illustration of Kuhn's paradigm shifts. So I continue to write, and then about a little over a week later, on the 4th of August, I wrote four possible themes, monographs, to occupy the next 10 years, 
One was the book I've been writing on the history of love and marriage. The second was a comparative study of judicial processes. And the third was the first hint that I wanted to write a book about the changing paradigms in the social sciences. My lectures would be based on the eight lectures for part two on evolution and change and four lectures on From Feudalism to Capitalism. My sources would be our collection of material on history of philosophy and sociology, our material on history and archaeology, and our books. We were building up a library of anthropology and travel. The present state of the work was a few earlier sketches in early lectures on Marx and Maine for communities, and workings on certain historians like Stubbs and Maitland. So it was practically fresh. Two days later, I described the main cycles in the social sciences, which I've already described the hints of progress in the, fairly, the early period, then the Enlightenment and the Scottish and French uh, periods of progressive thought then the reaction against that, and then evolution in its most um, rapid form, and then the withdrawal, and then the resurgence. So the central problem is to apply to the cosmologies of Western industrial literate high culture, the kinds of analysis which anthropologists have made of non-Western societies in other words, of open and closed knowledge, uh, open and closed systems, and of what influences cosmologies and systems of causation and philosophy. To my knowledge, no anthropologist has attempted to do this. There are, there are hints of it in the works of Lowy, Evans, Pritchard, Horton, Goody, Leach, and others. The same day, I wrote briefly about the determinants of cosmologies. <clears throat> Added to the social, usual social causes of thought analysed in relation to simple societies, one has got the complex technological, political and other changes which affect thought. The tools of thought change. The tools of thought change thought itself. For example, printing, films, computing. Thus, it is essential to look at all these as well as products of thought, in other words, the books and ideas. The same day, on the 6th, I wrote on a heading, the long-term and short-term changes, and I tried to illustrate it with another diagram showing progressivism and so on. And you can see they're sort of climbing the mountain, as it were. Four days later, I wrote under the heading Evolutionism and Technological Political Dominance. One necessary, if not sufficient, cause of an evolutionary view may be a gap in technology politics. Thus, no coincidence that evolution no longer in favour in Europe from about 1890 onwards, as the dominance of Europe declined. And no coincidence that the new evolutionism is most conspicuous in American anthropology, which feels itself superior technologically, economically, politically, and hence historically evolutionary thought is in fashion. Thus, static, circular evolutionary views are related not to the actual state of society, but to its relation to other societies, like relative deprivation, in reverse, relative superiority. After all, it is a necessary ideology for action, rule, power, and so on. Thus, just as the Whig view of history is related to Victorian superiority. Um, so all long-term evolutionary views are related to a feeling of innate 
superiority. On the 14th, four days later, under the heading Anthropology, Sociology and Evolution, I wrote both anthropology and sociology are deeply embedded in progressivist and particularly evolutionist views, since their acknowledged roots are in the two period sets of writers who were most conspicuously evolutionists. In other words, the late 18th century progressivists and the later 19th century evolutionists. However much there may have been a reaction against such feelings of superiority in the first part of the 20th century in some quarters, it is still lurking there, just as it is in historical work, ready to pop out. And necessarily, since without such a frame, it is arguable that ultimately anthropology is without any causal framework and hence any real meaning and also of little relevance to us if each culture is separate. How do they concern us? <coughs> the problem and the trick is somehow to separate out the various strands of evolutionism. Thus, clearly, there is technological, physiological and perhaps even moral and intellectual evolution. But at the same time, their nature is different from what is commonly imagined. Then on the 15th of August, I had the idea of making a similarity between the major three periods and the famous rites of passage of Van Genep, as in this diagram. Uh, and wrote, there is a curious similarity between the great profile of evolutionary theory and the schematic representation of the rise of evolutionism and decline and the pre-1750 period, the middle period, and then back to functionalism. And I wrote about evolutionism, progress and optimism. Evolutionism is strangely a radical and optimistic view, almost liberal, for it believes that things are constantly changing and in general, the tendency is towards something better, especially when coupled with the idea of the civilizing process. It is likely to be most prevalent in periods of rapid economic growth, rapid technological growth, rapid political growth, both in relation to the past and in relation to other societies. Thus we see evolutionism, progressivism, dominant in Scotland, as opposed to the Highlands uh, of uh, the southern Scotland, as opposed to the Highlands in the 18th century. In 18th century France, in later 19th century England, and later 20th century America. There has to be some idea of movement, of direction, of destiny and mission, and an idea of oneself as the provider of civilization. A day later, I wrote under the heading Evolutionism and Evolution, the features. The theoretical paradigm of evolution is particularly complicated because each theorist gives the word concept a different meaning. Thus, we can call Marx an evolutionist or an anti-evolutionist, anti a revolutionary thinker. To disambiguate, to disambiguate the word, we can make a start by separating various features, continuums along which writers have placed themselves. Uh, is there supposedly a moral dimension to evolution from worse to better? Uh, as in a, a little diagram. Secondly, is the evolutionary framework universal? In other words, it is unilineal evolution. Or, or is it? And whereby all societies grow through the same stages. Or is it multilineal? Morgan is an example of the first, main of the second. Thirdly, how does one get from one stage to another? There are two contrasts here. Internalist explanations, for example, class conflicts, 
or externalist, for example, diffusion from elsewhere, and gradualist, as opposed to sudden break, revolutionary evolution. Four, the length of the cycles and stages, rapid changes or long term, the degree to which it is circular, the number of levels upon which evolution occurs, from those who limit it to technological to those like Avebury, who see evolution of religion, morals, ethics, language, and so on. Sixthly, the ultimate dynamic or causes of evolution, some necessity, as with Spencer, a natural tendency for simplicity to turn to complexity of Durkheim, population growth, and hence the division of labor, Marx, the dynamics of the dialectic, Darwin, population and natural selection, and the 18th century Scots, a natural growth of reason, civilization, and smoothness. Seventhly, the criteria for distinguishing the stages, for example, technological, as in archeology, span or means of subsistence as hunting, pastoral, and so on, or the relations of production as in Marx. And eighthly, the views we have of the future towards which we are moving inexorably, optimistic, Marx, or pessimistic, Weber, known, Marx, or unknown, Darwin. Then on the 20th of August, I wrote Evolutionary Frameworks in the Social Sciences. In anthropology, you have the stages hunter-gatherer, tribal, peasant, industrial, and in the 19th century, savage, barbarian, and civilized, as in Morgan's schema. In sociology, you have community to association, status to contract, traditional to modern, mechanical to organic solidarity, in history, you have ancient, medieval, modern. In archaeology, stone, bronze, iron. In demography, pre-transition, transition, post-transition. Post in Marxism, tribal, feudal, peasant, uh, capitalist, communist. Thus, almost all the frameworks are within which we still place our data and think were developed and elaborated in the unusual conditions of the 19th century. Then, a week later, are the last two entries in the Thoughts book. On the 27th, I wrote The Ebb and Flow of Progressive Evolutionism in Sociological Thought. After the progression of the Enlightenment comes the reaction against them, Malthus, Burke, and so on. Then, commencing with writers born after the French Revolution, there's a heightening of optimism. Works written 1830 to 1880, and particularly 1850, are generally progressive and optimistic, thus Kant, Mill, Spencer, Marx. But as in anthropology and history, there is a reaction in the 1880s, when the second generation, Durkheim, Weber, Simmel, and so on, become functionalist and anti-progressive. Always in each period there are dissident voices, for example, Le Play or de Tocqueville, during the optimistic period. But the general tenor, the climate, is optimistic. Incidentally, I'm not sure Kant should have been included in the mid-19th century. And the final entry is Parallels in Art, Literature, in relation to evolutionary and static views. Whenever there is a move towards medievalism, one can be sure of a conservative reaction, an attack on evolutionism. Thus, with the romantic nostalgia of Scott and the Gothic movement of the period 1810 to 1830, and then later the pre-Raphaelite movement, with Maitland as a historian and others, both periods of reaction against secularization and progressivist views. So those are just some of the thoughts. If you 
have missed any of that and want to read about it, I will put the transcript of it uh, alongside this video on streaming media service. And I'm sorry about some misquotations or um, stumblings and also some strange cutting uh, due to the fact that my iPhone seems to um, have a propensity to suddenly shut itself off in the recording from time to time. Anyway, thanks for listening.